Welcome. My name is Daniel Schill. I am the president of the International Linear Algebra Society, or ILAS. We are a partner on this new version of the joint meetings, and among other activities, we have this, the first in-person ILAS lecture at the JMM. A special committee of ILAS has chosen a Purva Kare from the Indian Institute of, the, of Science in Bangalore to deliver this first in-person ILAS address. It's an honor for me to introduce him to you. He has brought interest with important publications in analysis, combinatorics, representation theory, matrix analysis. His most recent book, jointly published by Cambridge University Press and the Hindustan Book Agency, is Matrix Analysis and Entry One's Positivity Preservers. He will be speaking today on analysis applications of sure polynomials. Apurva. So, um, thank you, uh, Professor Schild. It's, uh, and thanks to the International Linear Algebra Society uh, for asking me to deliver this address. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. It's also, I guess, a relief to be here in, in, in person in joint math meetings. So, uh, and yes, good morning. Thanks everyone for coming. I will, uh, yeah, I'll talk about analysis applications of sure polynomials. So, sure polynomials are inherently uh, algebraic objects. So, I first encountered them in my PhD in representation theory. They're characters of uh, Lie groups and Lie algebras of representations of those, uh, but. Uh, Eventually, they're also central to symmetric function theory. Uh, today's talk is about how they have been showing up in analysis. Okay. So uh, the talk is in three parts. Uh, the first part is sort of half the talk. It's about entry-wise functions that preserve positivity and how these lead naturally to sure polynomials. This is sort of the journey that I myself took, and this is how I found out about sure polynomials occurring naturally in this, this part of analysis. So uh, that's the first part. And then from there we get to, uh, oops, sorry. From there we get to uh, how sure polynomials show up in majorization inequalities. Uh, and then finally, the sure polynomials in analysis will help sort of give back something to algebra in terms of uh, symmetric function identities. Okay, so let's start with entry-wise functions and positivity preservers. So the notion of positivity uh, has been studied in many different settings in the literature. Uh, here are some of the flavors. Uh, the most important one for this talk is PN, the cone of positive semi-definite matrices. So for this talk, all matrices, I think until the last slide or something, are real and symmetric. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the positivity just means the condition you see on the slide, you, you transpose AU is non-negative for all test vectors U. Um, okay, and then there are several other notions, as you can see. Um, okay, and a question that has been studied for uh, quite a while now, as I will sort of display on the next slide, is to understand which operations preserve positivity in each of these settings. So here are some of the people who have worked on entry-wise functions acting on matrices. Uh, and the, the names are, the, the relevant people are in blue and sure in red. And they seem to be quite a tightly knit family. You know? So the youngest among them, if you will, is Roger Horn, uh, whom some of you might know from the Bateman-Horn conjecture, number theory, and others might know from his famous books in matrix analysis with Charlie Johnson. And Horn is 75 years old. So uh, yeah, this goes back a long way, the study of entry-wise functions acting on matrices. <clears throat> the name of Schur is uh, specifically in red because a Schur and Frobenius above him uh, show up in this picture from the algebraic side, and Schur again with the other names below him in blue show up from the analysis side as well. So Schur is kind of central, not just to the slide in the picture, but to the whole thing. Uh, and everything related to Schur polynomials will be in red in the talk, in the slides. Okay, so to set some notation, given um, an integer n, a size, a dimension, and a domain i, uh, 
let Pn of i denote the n cross n positive matrices, which means the, the condition you saw on the previous slide, the quadratic form is positive semi-definite with entries in i. So we don't care about the eigenvalues, we care just about the entries. And the problem that, say, I've been interested in, but several of the names mentioned on the previous slide, um, for which functions f with domain i, is it true that if you start with the matrix, n cross n, positive, with entries in i, and you act entry-wise now, not on the spectrum, not by the holomorphic you know, functional calculus, but just the entry-wise action, when is it true that for positive input matrices, you get positive output matrices? And it's clear that some answers are easy. Fx equals x obviously works. You don't change the matrix. Fx equals 1 also works because the all ones matrix is positive. Are there any others? And then, the, yeah, so the answer is yes. There are plenty of other examples. And the starting point of this is with sure. As I said, he was central to the whole thing. So the sure product theorem in analysis says that if A and B are two positive matrices, then so is their entry-wise product. So this, the usual product of two symmetric matrices may not be symmetric. The, the entry-wise product is. So this is, again, a real symmetric matrix. But now, uh, if you have, uh, say, two functions satisfying this preserving condition, and you take f of A and g of A are both positive, then f, you take the entry-wise product, that's f times g of each entry. So this means that the set of functions that preserve positivity is closed under pointwise multiplication. <clears throat> and as a consequence, since I told you 1 and x lie in the class of preservers, so does x squared, x cubed, and so on, all of those. Okay? So that's the last line here, f of x equals x to the k preserves positivity. But now you can also look at... Uh, the condition here, the defining condition, and you notice that if f of a and g of a satisfy that condition, so does their sum. So do scalar multiples, like positive multiples. So the class of preservers is closed under sums, products, positive multiples, um, pointwise limits, of course. This condition is a closed condition, and it contains 1 and x. So because it contains 1 and x, hence the monomials, hence polynomials with positive coefficients by taking sums and scalar multiples. And then you can take limits of you know, Taylor polynomials and check that it's an easy, easy check that every power series, which is convergent, and all the CKs are non-negative, preserves positivity. And this is, again, a very old result. So Polya and Zigo uh, observed this in their book in 1925. And they asked, is there anything else? And that takes some time to prove that it took some time to answer the question, and that was done by Schur's student, Schoenberg, and he said that there are no other continuous functions that work. So the following are equivalent for matrices with entries in negative one to one. F is a power series of that kind, if and only if it preserves positivity in all dimensions. Uh, as, I, as I wrote down here, so eventually, of course, it's natural to ask, what about discontinuous functions? Well, that was done. So 17 more years later, Rudin, Walter Rudin, removed the continuity assumption, but he also did the following. So two implies one here is what Polya and Zego observed. One implies two is the hard part, where you deduce analyticity from the positivity preserving property. So Rudin said you don't need to use all test matrices in every size. You can just use a much smaller subset of rank at most three. So if you take all matrices, which are positive, with rank at most three of every dimension, and also, Rudin said, you can, you can further insist that the matrices be toplets, meaning all the diagonal entries are the same, all the subdiagonals are the same, and so on. So uh, that's, that's the restricted test set, a much smaller one, which also implies the same thing. So that was Rudin's result. And uh, in parallel, last year, we were able to show that uh, you can replace the word toplets by Hunkel and still ask for rank at most three, and the same conclusion can be drawn. F is a convergent power series. So, uh, so this is a very nice and clean ending to the, to the question of Polya and Zego, which is what are all the positivity preservers in all dimensions? So the natural next question would be, <clears throat> what about a fixed dimension? And um, 
so that's not just a theoretical refinement. It's also important in applications where you want to regularize, you know, like high dimensional covariance matrices, like sample covariance matrices, and get sort of sparser, cleaner um, covariances. And uh, there you do want to sort of induce sparsity by acting on spurious correlation entries. Well, if you have any positive real number and you act by a power series and positive coefficients, you never get to zero. So it's really restrictive to preserve positivity, to ask to preserve positivity in all dimensions. You just care about the, set, the, the size, the number of variables in your problem, and you want to fix the dimension. OK, so what is known about this problem now? So the, the all dimensions problem is completely solved. What about the fixed dimension problem? Well, so let's say one cross one. What functions preserve positivity on one cross one matrices? Well, these are just any function taking zero infinity to itself. How about two cross two? For two cross two, this was solved. Uh, it's a functional inequality and some monotonicity. Uh, so how about three cross three? Well, three cross three, unfortunately, is still open. So even now, we don't have a complete understanding of functions that preserve positivity for th just for three cross three matrices, let alone anything larger. OK, so what is known in three cross three uh, is at least one thing that is known is a necessary condition. Uh, sorry, yes. Uh, and this necessary condition itself dates back almost 60 years, or more than 50 years. It's by Lovner, uh, and it appeared in print in the thesis or the paper of his student, Roger Horn. <clears throat> But Lovner initially had summarized these computations in a letter to Josephine Mitchell. And uh, so 1967, I think, is the year before Lovner passed away. And 1969 is when Horn's paper got published, the year after. Uh, but he, as Horn says in the paper, the following is due to Lovner. Uh, so before my present job, I was working at Stanford, where Lovner was a faculty uh, many decades ago. And so one day, my co-author and I, we went to the library and we asked for all the boxes that you know, Lovner's papers after he passed away, they were given to the library. And we were digging through the boxes and we found exactly this handwritten letter to Josephine Mitchell and here's a snapshot. So as the initial opening lines say, when I got interested in the following question, let f be a function defined uh, in some interval and now look at a matrix with entries in that interval. What properties must F satisfy, must F have, in order that the matrices F of AIJ, the entry-wise transforms, be positive? And he found out that if F is n minus 1 times differentiable, then the following conditions are necessary. The, the function is non-negative on the positive side, its derivative is non-negative, and so on and so forth. The first n derivatives from order 0 to order n minus 1 must all be non-negative on that, the interval. And uh, on, the second, uh, on the second page that I have uh, below, there's a computation that he works out on the third line. The proof, I think, no, the, yeah. You look at the function, you look at the matrix, AIJ equals alpha plus omega alpha I alpha J on the first line, sorry. And then the idea is you compute the, apply the function to this matrix. This is a positive matrix, so its determinant is positive. Take the derivatives of the determinant. So differentiate the determinant many times and find out what the Taylor coefficients are. And that calculation will show up in the third part of the talk. But for now, we go back to the first page of Lovner's letter and the condition C that you see. F of t is bigger than 0, f prime is bigger than 0, and so on. So let's go back to the original problem. So I have a, let's say I have a polynomial, even simpler than any function. I have a polynomial with exactly n plus 1 terms. And it preserves positivity on n cross n matrices when applied entry wise. So, by the theorem I just, by the necessary condition I showed you, uh, the first n derivatives are zero, uh, non negative. The real question is can the leading term, can the next one be negative? Or does it also have to be non negative? And uh, if you think about it, uh, the first theorem I showed you, Schoenberg's theorem, said if you have a power series or a polynomial that positive coefficients, then it preserves positivity in every dimension. Now, I'm only asking to preserve positivity in a fixed dimension. It's a much smaller test set. You should expect many more examples, many more functions to work. So in particular, there should be at least one uh, 
polynomial with a negative coefficient that preserves positivity in fixed size. However, until 2016, uh, not a single example was known. So, yeah, but eventually now we have an answer to the question. Yes, there do exist polynomials where that C prime, the leading term, is negative. And we can, yes, we can compute the sharp bound. Okay, um, sorry. More generally, if you look at the coefficients of uh, the degrees of the monomials above, the first n degrees are no, 0, 1, 2, 3. But a general polynomial don't, doesn't need to start with um, those degrees. You can have any degrees. Even then, Lovner's theorem applies. You can prove that uh, the first n non-zero coefficients must be positive. Can the next one be negative? Same question. Uh, the answer turns out to be yes, and so this is maybe the first result uh, that answers it for general classes of polynomials. So fix a row, which is the size of the domain, roughly, and take a general polynomial with n plus 1 monomials. Okay? Re all coefficients are real. The following are equivalent. The function, this polynomial, entry-wise, preserves positivity in a fixed dimension on matrices with entries from 0 to row. So a fixed bounded domain. You can take closed as well. Everything is continuous. If and only if the, all these coefficients are non-negative, that's just the sure product theorem, Polya and Zego, yeah? Or the first n have to be strictly positive. That's Lovner's condition. And the next one can be negative. And there's a, there's a strict lower bound. It's a sharp bound. Uh, it's the negative reciprocal of some expression which you see on the board, uh, on the slide, yeah? And you see that there's a part in red. And as I said, all parts red have to do with sure. So we will get to the sure connection shortly. If and only if. So the, there's a third if and only if in analogy with what Rudin and we had done in all dimensions. You, do, you don't need to look at all matrices of that size. You can restrict to very low rank matrices, rank one in this case. And you can even do Hankel. So much smaller test set than the full cone. Okay. A um, couple of remarks. This holds even if the powers, the exponents are not integers. There's some relaxation of that. Uh, for that, you can look at the paper. And the baby case that I asked first, with the, when the initial exponents are just 0 through n minus 1, was in fact the first time we observed these examples exist uh, in 2016. And then the general case was solved about five years later. Okay, so how does that red number, uh, as I said, occur in this? So this shows up because it's essentially two applications of the Weyl dimension formula, one divided by the other. Yeah. Or if you like symmetric functions, then it's two applications of the principal specialization formula for sure polynomials. So the key in proving that result, that the result here, and coming up with these initial, the first examples of uh, polynomials with negative coefficients that preserve positivity, was to use sure polynomials, uh, except we will use them as functions. So as I said, they're algebraic objects, but we will use them as functions on the positive orthant to prove the theorem. I won't give you the proof <laughs> here. Yeah, so, uh, so let me define sure polynomials. There are two definitions. This one is due to Cauchy. Uh, so given an increasing tuple of powers, exponents, the corresponding sure polynomial uh, is the idea is you take a generalized van der Mond matrix, ui to the nj. Uh, the determinant is a polynomial in the uis. It is also alternating because you, know, you switch, you flip the two rows, you get negative. Because it's alternating, it is divisible by the van der Mond determinant in the us. So you divide it, and you get an honest polynomial, which is called the sure polynomial. Uh, OK. Um, the denominator is the van der Mond. Fine. Uh, so these, these are, yeah, very special classes of symmetric fo po polynomials. Uh, some people in symmetric function theory call them symmetric functions, but, and that is exactly what I would like to think about in this talk. These are actually functions, and they're symmetric, not just polynomials, algebraically. Okay, uh, they, so sure polynomials are a basis of homogeneous symmetric polynomials, a very important basis, maybe the most important basis. Um, and they are characters of irreducible representations of the general linear group or the special linear Lie algebra. And in the setting of SLN, uh, or SLN plus 1, if you will, the 
initial equation, the ratio of the two determinants, is a ratio of two sums over W, over the symmetric group. And that is exactly how you see the wild character formula in representation theory. This is the type A wild character formula. The Vandermond determinant is the wild denominator, and the numerator is, again, some alternating sum. And so these are characters, and usually one defines them in terms of semi-standard Young tableau, which is on the next slide. And if you do specialize all of them to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, then you see you get exactly uh, the expression nj minus ni. So if I take a ratio of two of these specializations, then I would get exactly this quantity inside the square, inside the big parentheses. So this number occurs because it's a ratio of two specializations of short polynomials. Yeah. And we will get to that in the, yeah, shortly. So uh, here are two examples of short polynomials now defined in a different way. This is Littlewood's definition using semi-standard Young tableau. And this is the more standard definition. I should point out that uh, the definition even on this slide might seem a bit strange to symmetric function theorists because the powers are, first of all, increasing, and secondly, they're strictly increasing. They should be non-decreasing, and then you sort of add some staircase partition to make them increasing. But for the purpose of you know, looking at Vandermond determinants, it was more natural to use this slightly deviant notation, non-standard notation. OK, so here are two examples then. So for m equals 0 to 4, so that's the powers, what you do is you uh, Remember, the, the numerator is ui power nj. The powers are 0, 2, and 4. The denominator would have the 3 by 3 van der Mond, so you know, 0, 1, and 2 as the exponents. So the first thing is because you divide 0, 2, 4 powers by 0, 1, and 2, you, you should be subtracting here 0, 1, 2 from 0, 2, 4. That gives you the shape 0, 1, 2, which means I draw 0 cells in the bottom row one cell in the next row, and two cells in the top row, and I create a shape, a uh, sort of triple, the three-cell tetra shape. That's called a Young diagram. I left adjusted, so it starts from the same place. And then I fill it up with the entries from one through capital N. The capital N denotes the alphabet. Yeah? So, uh, and the rule is, for semi-standard Young tableau, entries, the numbers must weakly decrease, or non-increasing, de non along every row and strictly decreasing down every column. So you fill up that three cell shape in all possible ways using one, two, and three. There are eight different ways. So, and then for every single filled up shape, filled up semi-standard Young tableau, I write down its weight, which is u3 square u2 for the first one, u3 square u1 for the second one, and so on. And I add all of them up, and you should notice that this fourth and the fifth, the two middle, uh, tableau have the same weight, u1, u2, u3. So I can get integer coefficients other than 1 and 0. And this is the short polynomial. So it's a non-trivial result that this definition of Littlewood is the same or equivalent to this definition of Cauchy. The Cauchy definition gives us that the short polynomial is symmetric and homogeneous. The Littlewood definition gives us that the short polynomial has integer positive coefficients. And so you can use all of this data together. You can combine all of this. But the, it's a non-trivial fact to prove that the two definitions agree. OK, so uh, this is what a short polynomial looks like. You can explicitly construct it this way. And for those of you who have seen representation theory, this is the character of the adjoint representation of SL3. There are six points in the hexagon. Those are the U3, ui square uj's. And there's two points for u3, u2, u1, that is the multiplicity of zero, the cartons of algebra. Anyway, but we won't use Lie theory in this talk. Uh, here is a second example of a sure polynomial, zero, two, and three. So when you again subtract the staircase partition, zero, one, two, you get zero, one, one. So I just have a column, a single column, with one cell and one cell. And I know that entries must strictly decrease. So you have only three possibilities, and that's the short polynomial. u1, u2, plus u2, u3, plus u1, u3. If you know, so now, since both of these, sh you can just see uh, that every short polynomial is going to be what one calls monomial positive, meaning it's a sum of monomials, which means that if you now think of these as functions, so now we really come to short polynomials as functions, when you think of them as functions on the positive real numbers, on the positive orthant, 
These are coordinate-wise non-decreasing or even increasing. The claim is that the ratio of these two, which doesn't factorize, it doesn't need to factorize, it doesn't, has the same property. Okay, so that's here. So if you look at the ratio, you get some rational function, which is symmetric. So, you know, you, and as I said, both the numerator and denominator are monomial positive, which means sum of monomials, or in fact, sure positive. They are a sum of sure polynomials. They are each a sure polynomial. So they are non-decreasing. The interesting thing is that their ratio has the same property, and this was sort of not known. Also not clear why, <laughs> even, yeah. And so this is the, this, and this goes through not just for you know, three uh, variables and the specific powers, but for every kind of every pair of integer tuples, sorry, uh, where the numerator tuple dominates over the denominator one. So this, this, this ratio as sure functions now, sure functions is non-decreasing in each coordinate. How would you prove such a thing? At least how would you verify the three by three, the three letter example. So, okay, um, to verify this, you know, how would an undergraduate verify this? Well, I have a function, I wanna prove it's non-decreasing, I take the derivative, right? So, let's do that. And this function is symmetric in three variables, so it's enough to differentiate with, say, u3, right? So, let's differentiate, low d high minus high d low, and you see that what you get is a monomial positive answer in the numerator. And then there is the division by some square, so that doesn't change the sign of the whole expression. Now, because this numerator is monomial positive, it's numerically positive, and you're done. The claim is proved. Okay? But it's stronger than that. In fact, so what you see is, if you look at the numerator again, I'm differentiating with respect to one of the variables. So it won't be symmetric for that variable, but for all the others, u1 and u2 in this case, it will be symmetric. So let's look at this polynomial, this expression, as a polynomial in U3. Look at all the coefficients. Uh, since there's a U3 directly attached, the constant term is zero. The linear term, as you can check, is actually a sure polynomial or a sum of those in, in, the, in, the, in U1 and U2. And the quadratic term is similarly a sum of two sure polynomials. I'd keep the X1, X2, U1, U2, separate from another u1, u2, and so I get two different sure polynomials, and the quadratic is also a sum of those. So, the, so when you write down the low d high minus high d low as a, as a polynomial in the variable of differentiation, every single coefficient of the powers is a sum of sure polynomials in the other variables. And this, this is exactly what happens in the general case for any number of variables, for any pair of integer tuples. So this low d high minus high d low would be numerically positive if it was monomial positive, and in fact, it, exactly the same thing happens. It's monomial positive, but in fact, the coefficient, every coefficient of un power j is sure positive in the remaining uis. And uh, there's a result of uh, Becky Petraeus and Stephanie van Billigenberg that shows that uh, if I have a general or generic uh, monomial positive expression, the chances or the proportion of those that are actually sure positive is actually quite low. So, and there's some Costco numbers that show up in this exact computation of the probability or the proportion. But the point is therefore somehow being sure positive given your monomial positive is something special or rare and this is one such instance. Uh, how does one actually show that this expression is sure positive? I mean, in each degree. This requires sort of a big hammer. This is a sure positivity result by Thomas Lamb, Alex Postnikov, and Pasha Pilyowski. Uh, yeah, and that's a deep result, but we are able to use that to prove uh, sure positivity and then, therefore, numerical positivity. It is also possible to prove the numerical part by itself using sort of involved linear algebra. And that's a separate argument also found in our paper. Okay, so that ends, as I said, the first part of the talk. And then, uh, so let me now get to majorization inequalities, in which, again, sure polynomials show up um, prominently. Sorry, yes. So let's go back, take one step back to the sure monotonicity dilemma, which said that if you look at a ratio of two sure polynomials, then this beats the value, well, it's coordinate-wise, sorry, coordinate-wise non-decreasing. 
So if the arguments ui are all bigger or equals one, then the value of the ratio beats the value at one, 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 which by the wild dimension formula is just the van der Bond. So it's natural to ask, you know, are there other tuples, m and n, for which this inequality holds for every u with coordinates bigger than one? Let me call, uh, let me call those, those u's or that set of u's as the log positive orthant. So the logs are positive, as opposed to the entire positive orthant, which is zero infinity to the n. Okay, so when does this inequality hold over the entire log positive orthant? It turns out, okay, sorry. So I should also say you can ask the same question not just for integer tuples of powers, exponents, but for real tuples. Uh, but then sure polynomials are not defined. So what you do is you say, well, I take, I, I take, uh, I multiply both top and bottom by the Vandermond in the U's. That will give me a generalized Vandermond matrix, UI to the MJ divided by determinant UI to the NJ. As long as the UIs are distinct, both matrices are non-singular, their determinants can be, you know, you can divide, and you can ask for the same condition. And so this is what we answered. So this inequality holds for all distinct coordinate tuples ui, if and only if, on the log positive orthant, if and only if m weakly majorizes n. So you get a sure polynomials, or more generally van der Bond determinants, connect now to inequalities as well in analysis, not just to positivity preservers, but also to inequalities via weak majorization. Uh, and this idea of looking at uh, dominating over the value at one was not really ours. It actually started about, I'll skip this for lack of time, but yeah, it started about uh, 10 years ago when uh, Cutler, Green, and Scandera looked at this exact same question for sure polynomials, but over the entire positive orthant, not the log. And uh, they answered one half of this, uh, they proved one half of this if and only if, and Suvrit Sra, who is at MIT, uh, he proved the other half. Is, and this inequality holds over the entire orthant if and only if M majorizes N. So over the log positive, that was if and only if weak majorizes, and over the orthant, it was majorizes. And majorization is the same as, you know, sort of, there are many different ways of saying it. Weak majorization was saying that the partial sums starting from the top for the Ms dominate those for the Ns, and majorization adds the extra condition that the total content is the same. Question, does this extend to real powers again, like we did for the weak majorization result? And secondly, we were able to use just the log positive orthant can one similarly use a smaller subset than the full orthant? And the answer turns out to be yes and yes. So here's the theorem. Given real powers again now, so you again look at the same inequality as last time. The ratio of the van der Mond determinants dominates the ratio of the van der Mond determinants of the powers for all u in the entire positive orthant with distinct coordinates if and only if M majorizes N, so exactly the same result as Cutler, Green, Scandera, and Sra. But you can also, part two says, you can look at just the log positive and the log negative orthants, and that's good enough. Okay, uh, okay. so uh, let me, some, maybe I'll give you one proof because we should have one proof in the math talk, I guess. So uh, I'll give you the proof that two and three are equivalent. So suppose I know that this inequality holds over all the tuples u in the log positive orthant. Then that was if and only if m weakly majorizes n from the previous result. How about for the log negative orthant? Well, if u is in the log negative, then you can look at the one over the uj's. You call that vj, let's say. And then just compute the left-hand side here, the determinant of v to the minus mj and vi to the minus nj below. That is literally just the determinant on the left-hand side, the ratio on the left-hand side of part two, which beats Vm over Vn, which is V minus M. So basically, we have the same result for the Vjs in the log positive orthant now, with the minus M and minus N. So again, by the previous result, that was if and only if M minus M weakly majorizes minus N. So part two is really saying that minus M weakly majorizes minus N, and M weakly majorizes n, that's the if and only if, and together those are the same as majorizing. 
Okay, so that's one way to derive this uh, strengthening of uh, or extension to real tuples with a strengthened smaller domain using our result on weak majorization. So, but anyway, these are all very, you know, closely knit, uh, closely related results and inequalities. What happens if you use other symmetric functions? So, let me restate the previous results slightly. I just cross multiply the terms. So, uh, this is the same inequality as previously, but just cross multiplied. So, the normalized Schur polynomial indexed by M beats the normalized Schur polynomial indexed by N on the entire orthant, if and only if M majorizes M. That was the previous result. If instead you use a different symmetric function, the monomial symmetric function, then you get a 100-year-old inequality, which also says this has the same conclusion, M if and only if M majorizes N. So these are examples of majorization inequalities. And maybe a natural question here in light of what how and I proved was what happens if one restricts the Muirhead inequality to the log positive orthant. I don't know. Uh, if you want to think about it, please go ahead and do so. And if you find something, then let me know. I would be very happy to learn about this. Okay, so all these examples and inequalities are examples, as I said, majorization. And uh, other such inequalities have occurred in the literature almost going back 300 years. Um, and recently, there was a vast generalization of some of these, or many of these, by Colin McSwiggin and John Novak to all while groups, so W majorization. Okay, so um, that's the sort of second part of the talk. So that same lemma, or the Schur monotonicity lemma, which is talking about ratios of Schur polynomials being coordinate-wise increasing and so on, led us both to prove a positivity result in, uh, in, in matrix analysis, but also a uh, 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 majorization inequality for weak majorization and for the full strong majorization. So sure polynomials really show up centrally in all of these areas and uh, in analysis. And finally, I want, as I said, I wanted to use this analysis ideas to give back in some sense. We can, they do end up giving back to algebra and to symmetric function theory. And here is, we start from the analysis idea again, from Lovner's letter to Josephine Mitchell. I said that on the second page there, there was some calculation. That's the calculation we start with. Now suppose I have a function that entry-wise preserves positivity. Lovner said, let's do the following. Let's, for simplicity, just take the basic idea underlying it. Here's his letter. So take some tuple, uh, the pairwise distinct entries, let's say. Look at the determinant of the rank one matrix, T times U times U transpose, further applying F to it, entry-wise and compute its derivatives at zero. So if you take the value, the, the value itself at zero, delta of zero is just the determinant of some matrix with all the same entries. That's a singular matrix, delta of zero is zero. In fact, Lovner checked that m many derivatives are zero. The first n choose two of them. And the first time you get a non-zero expression, you get the Vandermont square, and then the expression in blue. So a product of Taylor coefficients of f. And what Lovner sort of missed out on spotting was the factor of one square uh, in, in, in that equation. So, I mean, it's, it's hard to spot a factor of one in an equation. It's even harder to spot a factor of one square. So uh, that was what he missed. Uh, and if, so what would have happened if he had actually taken one more derivative? Well, if he had, then uh, probably I wouldn't be standing here because all of this would be known before I was born. So. Uh, what happens is <clears throat> when you take one more derivative, you similarly get the Vandermont square and the product of the Taylor coefficients. The last one changes the order of differentiation. But in the middle, the red factor that you get is an, is an actual sure polynomial, is a symmetric function. This is the symmetric function corresponding to the, to the Young diagram with one cell, which you can fill up with semi-standard Young tableau with any of the n letters, and then you add them up. So it's the square of a sure polynomial. And this idea is what provides a sort of a novel bridge now going back from analysis to symmetric functions. So let me just recap the problem again. Given some smooth function, given pairwise distinct, uh, let's say, UIs, actually also pairwise distinct VIs, uh, set delta of T to be the determinant of F applied to a rank one matrix and compute the Taylor coefficients. 
this turns out to uncover every Schur polynomial. So there's a specific explicit expression, there's a Vandermond part, there's a Taylor coefficient part, and there's a Schur polynomial part. And this happens for every smooth function. And so depending on the n, the tuple n that uh, indexes the Schur polynomial, every such tuple occurs inside you know, the sum of the n's, the derivative for capital M being the sum of the n's. Now in particular, let's say f is a power series, a smooth power series, yeah? So uh, then if you take the determinant of f of t uv transpose, u and v are fixed, t is the variable, then you get a power series delta, the determinant. What is the expansion? What are the coefficients of that power series? Uh, and uh, let's see, so this is, this is a result by Cauchy, uh, and this is, as I said, this has a really long history. So Cauchy's result is uh, about what, more than 100 years before Lovner. He applied this for the function, the power series, which is the usual geometric series. Yeah? And uh, again, it's hard to spot factors of one, <laughs> as uh, we know from Lovner's time. So uh, the, the, when, so Cauchy's identity, this is a famous one in symmetric function theory, says that uh, the determinant of f applied to uv transpose is again, there's a Vandermond part, there's a Schur part, and then this time Cauchy missed the Taylor series part because it was all ones. So it's even, even harder to spot one power n Okay, uh, this identity was generalized then by Frobenius to a sum of two geometric series. This is the sum. Uh, and uh, this was f of uv transpose, then becomes, again, there's a Vandermont part, and the Schur part, and th then the expansion sort of is broken up into two sums. So it's natural to ask, what is the expansion for a general power series, f of t? meaning summation f, m, t to the m, and applied entry-wise to such a matrix. And similar kind of questions have been studied by uh, several different people in the literature, um, yeah, um, in sort of well-known papers in the field. Um, so here is the answer then for a general power series. So take any commutative unital ring, uh, take any, uh, yeah, take any uh, power series over it, take any uh, vectors u and v, and now evaluate the determinant of the power series applied to t times u times v transpose. Again, there's a Vandermond in u, Vandermond in v, and then you see again there's a, there's a sure polynomial part that I guess Lovner missed but Cauchy knew, and the Taylor series part which Cauchy missed but Lovner knew. Yeah? And so this is a, this sort of, uh, but the idea that this can be done sort of came from Lovner's analysis calculation in that letter to Josephine Mitchell in 1967. And then uh, upon computing higher order derivatives, one comes across short polynomials in there. But then it gives back these new identities in algebra, in symmetric function theory, to, uh, to uh, yeah, to, to algebra. So uh, this is for the determinant. It's natural to ask, well, you know, if you do linear algebra like uh, or matrix theory, another closely you know like related connected quantity, of course with very different properties, is the permanent. And you can ask what happens if I replace determinant by the permanent. There is uh, an analogous expansion. There are, is an analogous identity. Uh, how about if I replace the permanent by some other you know, character, irreducible character of the symmetric group? Then those are called imminents. So there, in fact, are imminent identities as well. And with uh, Siddharth Sahi of Rutgers, uh, we, did, we were able to extend uh, these, uh, these kind of identities to uh, all imminents or even all complex class functions over all unital rings, uh, commutative rings, and for all power series. Uh, this is for commuting variables, but then you can also do the same thing for anti-commuting you know, fermionic variables, U and V. So, and those, all of those details can be found in the paper. Uh, that paper appeared online, uh, like in, in the volume, literally this morning. So now it exists online uh, as well. And uh, yeah, so the natural question uh, to ask again is, you know, I, I mentioned all these papers at the beginning, at the top of the slide. Uh, are there, you know, kind of 
other imminent identities and fermionic identities for analogs of the results in those papers. Uh, I haven't looked into it, but again, if anyone is interested, please feel free to do so. Okay, so I guess that's, that's that for the talk. And uh, I should end with some slides, uh, sorry, some references. So, uh, yeah, so there, for the three parts of the talk, there are three sets of references. Uh, the first one is with starting with sure. So, as I said, everything starts with sure. And uh, then it's Schoenberg who proved sure's theorem, the converse to it, sorry. Rudin who removed the continuity hypothesis and uh, reduced the test set to uh, rank three and Hunkel matrices. And the reference seven is where we did the same, sorry, toplets. Reference seven is where we did the same for Hunkel. Uh, reference four, Christensen and Russell also approved Schoenberg's theorem in an entirely different approach using Choquet theory, extreme points in the Choquet cone. And five and six are the papers where we uncovered or discovered sure polynomials when they act, uh, as they show up to answer questions about preserving positivity in a fixed dimension via polynomials. Uh, and finally, I should point out reference eight, which is that much of the theory I told you here and the results are found in the book that I uh, was able to finish writing. Maybe I should show you the book. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I was told by my editor in Cambridge that I should show up today evening to the thing when it opens at 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. or something uh, to meet her. I've never met her. And then, okay, this is part one. And then part two, uh, majorization inequalities. Uh, thanks to Cutler, Green, and Scandera, who had this very nice survey of previous results in their paper. So all these old papers exist. And then five and six are the versions which I showed you 10 years back uh, for sure polynomials to connect to majorization. And then we extended some of those results and got weak majorization results in seven. And then, then you have yeah, spherical functions on you know, uh, symmetric spaces of non-compact type in reference eight. That's the big generalization of many of the old results by McSwiggin and Novak. Finally, symmetric function identities. Uh, yeah, so again, Cauchy, Frobenius, and Lovner. The whole point of the new stuff is that Lovner uh, thought about applying, uh, differentiating delta of t for smooth functions, f applied to uh, a rank one matrix, and that led to some other things. Uh, four, five, six, seven are the other papers which, you know, as I said, if you want to try looking at fermionic identities and so on. Uh, and eight and nine are the recent ones with bosonic and fermionic imminent identities. Thank you again.